Today is going to tackle risk management, and I think you're going to walk out of here, and I suspect you'll be scratching your head and saying, yeah, uh, he's right. I never thought of that in before. I never, I never saw it in that light. And you'll have one of those epiphanies, and that's a word like behoove, by the way, in case you weren't in the morning session, um, that I often have when I talk with Bob, because he, he puts things in a very interesting perspective, and you see it in a new light. So um, I won't go through all the commendable work that he has done, but he has certainly accomplished a great deal in his um, career, and there's so much more that he's involved in now as a volunteer on many boards and active in the cultural and arts community. And I want him to thank him because he did come in to talk to the class in financial management, I think it was, and... Uh, and he has engaged with our students a few times this past semester, obviously, and he just jumped right up quickly and said, yes, I'd be happy to be a keynote. He's one of the first people to confirm, so um, we're really privileged to have Bob with us here today, and without further ado, thank you, sir. Thanks, Shelley. Um, I, I don't know what to do with these kinds of introductions because uh, it's... It's like uh, being introduced to someone who isn't you. Nevertheless, nevertheless, you have to embody yourself, and here we go. The topic that I was asked to speak on, managing risk for the not-for-profit arts sector, is one that um, is very special for me at the moment because I'm actually teaching a course on risk management in the cultural sector at um, University of Toronto Scarborough this term and preparing for 12 three-hour lectures is a lot of preparation and so I'm like really uh, beefed up on this particular topic. Risk management is hot and it is in absolutely one of the fastest growing professions in Canada and around the world. Risk management. Such a thing was never discussed and risk manager was never identified when I was young as an official occupation and certainly not a kind of designation or a certification that one could earn. Yesterday, I did a Google search. Workopolis listed 2,925 vacancies for risk managers yesterday. Yesterday? Indeed.com listed 12,446 such vacancies in Canada with 5,095 risk management vacancies in Toronto alone. Wowjobs.ca listed 10,367 risk management vacancies in Canada with 3,874 in Toronto. Deutsche Bank just announced that in 2015, it, it added 2,700 non-front of office staff to its workforce, Deutsche Bank, and a hefty proportion of those were risk managers and compliance professionals. According to Glassdoor, the average compensation for risk managers in its surveys is currently $102,193. And in the UK, total compensation for risk management professionals increased in the four years between 2012 and 2016 by 25% compensation for risk managers in the UK. What's going on? Why all this emphasis on risk management? Much of what's happening today is in reaction to some high fro profile business shenanigans that took place in the 90s. Investors lost billions of dollars to companies like Enron, which were structured as Ponzi schemes, literally. The public demanded greater protection, which in turn led to cries for higher standards of accountability. A major outcome was the 2002 Sarbanes-Oxley legislation in the United States that raised the bar for financial reporting and auditing of all kinds. Despite this public scrutiny, 
And despite this increased demand for greater regulation, Sarbanes-Oxley was followed in 2007 by the meltdown of the US banking sector. So much for regulation. Based on the issuance and subsequent sale of subprime mortgages that triggered a global economic crisis that we're finding ourselves still trying to drag our way out of. The public demanded even more protection and the contemporary practice of risk management came into its own. Today, there are dozens of programs across Canada that lead to the certification of risk managers, but by and large, the field of risk management is geared to insurance, finance, accounting, and audit. So, there's this enormous explosion in a professional designation called risk management, and it's almost all in the financial realm. So what's the connection with the not-for-profit art sector? Why is this even a topic for our consideration? The answer is simple. Not-for-profits are governed by boards of directors increasingly drawn from the worlds of business and finance. In exercising their fiduciary responsibilities, i.e. when the boards of directors do their job as fiduciaries for the organizations that they govern. Fiduciary, of course, meaning undivided loyalty to the well-being of that organization. Some people confuse fiduciary with financial. It's not the same thing. It's undivided loyalty. So when the boards of directors exercise their fiduciary responsibility, they instinctively turn to what they know best to what they use in their own work to protect their organization's interests. And that, it turns out, is risk management. Boards of directors increasingly want to know what are the biggest risks facing the not-for-profits they voluntarily govern and what is management intending to do about them. I can vouch for this personally. I've been on both sides of the board table and the language and the conversation has changed <coughs> radically, radically in the last 10 years. Awkwardly, little of the risk management, or sorry, little of the language for risk management comes from the not-for-profit sector. As I pointed out, it really comes from another sector of society altogether, the financial realm. Sarbanes-Oxley, for example, specifically excludes not-for-profits. But that doesn't negate the value of seeing not-for-profits through a risk management lens. In fact, doing so is a valuable governance strategy and risk analysis should be an essential part of Henry Arts Manager's toolkit. I can tell you it's a foolish arts manager today who responds to a question from the board, what is your risk management analysis or what is your risk analysis of this organization and answers, oh, I don't know, or oh, what's that got to do with what we do? What's that got to do with making art? It's a foolish response. Uh, anyone on their game should be able to understand the nature of the question from the board members and have already in their hard drive uh, uh, a strategy for responding to these questions, not with all the answers, but with an attitude or an openness to be engaged in a risk management conversation. So how does it work? First, it's essential to identify what kinds of risks a particular organization faces. These fall into categories. And it's important to begin by saying, well, what categories of risk exist in this organization? Typical categories of risk can include financial risks, legal or regulatory compliance, HR risks, artistic risks, <coughs> ethical risks, fundraising risks, IT risks, catastrophic risks, reputational risks, and the list goes on. 
sitting down with colleagues and just making a list can be revelatory in itself. Then it's necessary to determine the risk appetite within the organization for each kind of risk. Risk appetite. How willing are we? What is the level of our appetite to have risks in each of these categories? This is essentially a board decision because the board is the body legally accountable for the organization's well-being. But the board's position will likely be strongly informed by what management says, so management should be actively engaged in this process. In not-for-profits, boards tend to have little appetite for financial risk, for example. Little appetite for non-compliance risk. Little appetite for ethical risk. But equally well, in the arts sector, they typically have a very big appetite for artistic risk. It's the nature of an arts organization to take artistic risks. And it's essential to have this conversation with boards to be able to stake one's ground, to be able to say, well, at least I don't have to be overly defensive on the artistic side for the risks that we're taking with an untried work, um, a new artist, a production that's never been seen before. None of it, though, can be taken for granted. The fact that you're in an arts organization, you cannot take for granted that the board understands that it has a big appetite for risk. In fact, in initiating the conversation, it's likely that they would say, we have a very small appetite for risk. It's only in the conversation does it elevate. Well, actually, that's not true. That's not true. We're not, we're not trying to put on Broadway musicals, necessarily. We're not trying to mount works that have already demonstrate their commercial validity. We are willing and anxious to take a flyer on things. That can only come from a conversation. You cannot assume that the board has this in their minds when they come to the board table. They do, I think, have this in their mind when they come to performances or to exhibitions, but it's not necessarily the case that this language comes easily to their lips because the language that comes most easily to their lists, lips is risk management language. It's language that essentially tries to mitigate risk. The next step is to identify specific risks within each category. What are the financial risks or the non-compliance risks or the fundraising risks facing the organization? It's one thing to say, I have financial risks. It's another thing to say, well, what are they? What are they? Well, you know, I have a confirmed, um, I have confirmed revenue from this funder for the next three years. Well, that's not a risk. You have it confirmed for the next three years. But I've sent in an application to this funder and it's not confirmed. Well, good. All right, we can identify that as a financial risk. What's uh, a, a kind of fundraising risk? Well, I've had this donor and this donor has been giving me $5,000 a year for the last four years and I have no reason to believe that they won't continue to do this, but I haven't been assured of this. Well, that's a risk. Uh, sitting down with uh, the, the donor might be a good idea to just have that kind of conversation. Identifying what the specific risks are in each category is necessary. When you've done all of these things, you have to assess them in terms of priority according to two simple dimensions. One of them is probability. How probable is this risk? And the other one is impact. How serious would it be to my organization if this risk came about? if this uncertainty proved to be true. Personally, I have a little rule of thumb. I, I score them in my head between one and five, with one being the lowest and five being the highest, and then I multiply them together. So if, if there was a hugely high probability, you would give it a five. This is highly probable. This is a risk that's likely going to happen. And if it's a kind of devastating impact, 
I would give it a five. If this happens and there's a high probability, we're in deep, deep, deep trouble. Multiply them together, you can have the highest possible score of 25. But you can see that there are differences as, as we go through um, allocating these kinds of things. For example, if you're holding an outdoor festival, let's say, the chance of rain may be three. And the potential impact of the rain may be four. So you'd end up with a rating of 12 out of 25. The chance of a tornado, on the other hand, might be one. But the impact would be five. So then you end up with a score of five. Why do you do this? Because what you want to do is compare the relative priority that you ought to be attaching to the various risks that are facing your organization. Once you've done this and rank them from highest to lowest score, if I can put it that way, you get some idea of, well, what are the things, the handful of things, count them on one hand, what are the handful of things that it might be wise for me to spend some serious time on? What do you do with that serious time? Once again, there are four generic strategies for dealing with risks. Once you've identified them, and once, you've once you know from a priority perspective um, that they require a response on your part. These four are to avoid, to ignore, to contain, and to transfer or share the risk. To avoid a risk means taking a decision not to proceed in a certain direction because the potential damage is deemed to be too great. This is presumably what the Toronto Symphony Orchestra intended when it cancelled the performance last fall by a contracted artist who had posted controversial political statements on social media. That was, I think, an intention to <coughs> avoid risk. The fact that the orchestra's decision generated a whole new category of risk, reputational risk, underlines the complexity of risk management itself, especially in an artistic context. I think they intended to avoid the risk and unwittingly generated a new kind of risk that wasn't on the table in the first instance. Avoidance, however, raises a consideration that I haven't mentioned yet. And that is that risk is the flip side of opportunity. The flip side of opportunity. It's kind of taking the concerned negative approach to something that has potential for the organization or for the future. Many people say the greater the risk, the greater the opportunity, or the greater the return. And we know this a lot from the stock market. The higher the volatility, simply or typically indicates the greater the possibility that you can either make big money or lose big money. And many people working in the cultural sector know about the volatility of the markets because they work in organizations that have endowed funds and the endowed funds are invested and the level of volatility of those investments is a really serious concern of the investment committee and of course of management in turn because when the returns are not good, uh, management doesn't have the revenue or the income that they want and they need um, to run the organization. And when the returns are very good, management says, whoa, whoa, you know, we have a chance in the future to have a little bit more se uh, security or stability from a financial perspective. Risk avoidance, simply stated, is a difficult strategy in a world where you want to make change. There is always an element of risk in change. The reason you want to make change, though, is because you see opportunities to do something different, better, more exciting, with greater return, etc. 
So avoidance as a response to risk is highly complex and needs to be carefully thought through. Just avoiding something, no, we're not going to do that. The risk is too great. Um, has a number of uh, very, very serious implications. To ignore a risk entails recognizing it's there, but deciding not to take any special precautions or actions, virtually doing nothing. Generally speaking, we ignore the risk of a sudden collision with the meteorite. As catastrophic as it would be, the risk falls into a category that we simply choose to ignore. Yes, it's possible. It is possible, and it would be absolutely catastrophic. But we would go nuts if we thought about all of the things that m might happen that could be catastrophic, but are highly unlikely to happen either in this moment or in this place or in my lifetime or what have you. The important thing, though, is that in terms of ignoring a risk, you must distinguish between ignoring, which is an active, actually an active process, and ignorance, which is not active and, sh and in a sense is a state of not even caring, not even exploring, not even identifying um, a, a risk as, as existing. It is perfectly reasonable to ignore a risk that is highly improbable in your universe. But I'm, I would urge you to at least have the conversation in whatever organization or whatever sitting you're, setting you're in um, to, to, to figure out what those risks are. To contain a risk means taking actions that in some way limit its probability or limit its potential impact. So remember, those are the two things, a probability and an impact that you're most concerned about. This is the most frequent strategy for managing risk, and we often call this mitigating the risk. So you hear a lot of language about risk mitigation. That's what people are talking about. They're talking about containing the risk in some way, either containing its probability or containing its impact. Developing and communicating detailed policies for handling harassment in the workplace is a good example. Harassment policies represent a risk management strategy of containment. In both their development and implementation, such policies help everyone to understand what is expected of them and anticipate the consequences of non-compliance. So there's a higher consciousness within the organization when these kinds of policies are developed and shared and a better understanding of what to do uh, if situations arise. Recent terminations at the Canadian Olympic Committee, for example, were triggered not by the alleged har uh, harassment itself. There was alleged harassment. The accused individual actually resigned voluntarily. But the terminations were based on the fact that the terminated staff had been informed of the accusations, but had not acted in a timely or appropriate manner as, clear, as clearly set out in its own policies. Detailed policies are examples of risk management containment, but you have to act on them you have to act on them or you trigger a new kind of risk and the termination of those employees at the Canadian Olympic Association uh, Committee is a good example of this. There are many such examples. The CBC, Giangameshi terminations, etc. Similarly, developing policies for what to do in the event of an IT breakdown or loss of power or three day snowfall are all risk management strategies. Knowing what to do when the system crashes is a risk management strategy. It's risk containment of some kind and a reasonable expectation of leaders in the not-for-profit sector. If you run organizations and you don't have like 
back cabinet of these kinds of strategies and responses, you're in trouble. You are making your organization vulnerable um, to risks in a needless manner. Another example would be an artistic offer that includes both known and unknown works. Proven successful works and high risk and unknown works in the same season. That's a way of containing risk. Okay, they might not all succeed, but over the time of the year, I can still sell tickets. I don't necessarily offend my audience. Um, you know, this kind of thing. This is a this is an example that I brought with me. Can, does anyone recognize what this is? Have, I got this in the mail. Almost everyone in Toronto got this in the mail. We didn't ask for this. This was sent in the mail to every friggin' address in the city. It says red block, potassium iodide tablets, blocks radioactive iodine. And it comes with a brochure that says, prepare to be safe. <laughs> and it's issued on the back by Durham Region, City of Toronto, Ontario Power Generation. This is a risk containment strategy by the nuclear energy industry. In case of a meltdown, when you're within 40 kilometers, 40 kilometers of one of these nuclear stations, and there is a release of radioactive material, it's possible that there will be an effect on your thyroid. And these tablets are to be taken as prescribed on the package and the little brochure every day until they're gone by whoever's in the household. This is a risk containment strategy by an industry that sees itself as wanting to express and position itself as caring about the public and anticipating bad things, um, you know, and, and, and limiting the bad things that might happen. We do this in the arts all the time. This is not financial risk. They're not worried about money here. They're worried about the health consequences of an accident, the kind of thing that happened in Japan with the tsunami. Um, things that are not predictable in the sense of what the probability might be, but are still imaginable and can be worked through or worked around or contained in some way. This is the kind of thing that we do in our professional lives within the not-for-profit arts sector um, on all of these different dimensions, from uh, financial, uh, doing this list, artistic, HR, ethical. We're doing this all the time. We're imagining what might happen that could be negative and how do we contain or manage that could happen uh, consequence in our particular work. Finally, Sharing or transferring risk entails either passing the risk on to someone else or coming to an agreement to share the risks with others. Both are central to how the insurance industry is structured and to why we willingly pay high premiums to purchase insurance coverage for many different kinds of potential events. Fire insurance health insurance, employment insurance, disability insurance, director's liability insurance, cancellation insurance, vehicle insurance, key man insurance. These are all examples, frequent, you know, a part of the normal work of the not-for-profit um, cultural sector in which transferring to the insurance company or sharing with other organizations and other interests, the risk is totally normal in our lives. A 
I should, I should point out, when you look at the insurance industry a bit, you can find evidence of sharing risk among agricultural workers three millennium back in Egypt. They weren't sure where the Nile River was going to rise or fall from one year to the next. And so what they would do is they would pool together their resources in good years and find a way to, to survive the bad years um, in a, in a risk-sharing context. This is very, very old. Even though I talked about risk managers as being a new industry, it's risk management is not the least bit new in terms of approaching and containing um, the possibility or probability of bad things happening in the future. I think that I would include uh, many forms of artistic collaboration in this category as well, including co-production, which I, which I, I know has been raised um, in, uh, other, uh, in other forums this morning. Having two or more companies share in the cost of creating and mounting a new work and then touring it from venue to venue makes a lot of sh sense from a risk sharing perspective whether it be in the performing arts or the museum sector. Lots of museums, for example, partner with other museums to put together a show, and then the show goes from this museum to that museum. Lots of performing arts organizations mount a new work, and then the work goes from one venue to another, from one market to another, um, and the risk <laughs> dissipates over a bigger base. This is also the case with many festival collaborations and underpins the work of many opera and ballet companies, theaters, musical ensembles, major museums. Both the risks and the opportunities are shared. Not only are the costs reduced in some way, but the opportunity to get a return or the probability of getting return is heightened uh, and increased in this process. It's also under the strategy that I would place the diversification of funding sources. We talk about that in Canada a lot. I had long believed that the diversity of public, private, and earned revenue sources made the Canadian not-for-profit arts sector more resilient. And while working at the National Ballet School, I got to see this resilience in practice. In 1995, the newly elected Harris government in Ontario announced it was cutting the school's funding by, wait for it, 100%. That was a loss of $836,000 a year. And yet, amazingly, we were able to end the next 11 years with surpluses, including the year we were cut. Largely thanks to the determination of the board to pursue alternative funding avenue. A diversity of funding sources is one of those risk-sharing strategies that works very well in the management of risk. This too is risk management and it's only possible when people are willing to work together. It's part of the nature of saying, what are my risks? How do we in some way mitigate them or prepare or uh, think ahead? And who can we bring into the fold to make that happen? In some respects, this all sounds straightforward, but I can tell you from my own experience, it's amazing how complicated it can all become. Personally, I think that the mass resignation of the Board of Directors of Goodwill Toronto a couple of weeks ago was designed to limit risks. They all resigned before they closed down the shops. But the result was anything but the mitigation of risk. Goodwill International deemed the mass resignation, in their words, egregious, which means outstandingly bad or shocking. And they stripped the organization of its membership in Goodwill International and its ability to use the Goodwill name or branding. I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know the backstory. But given that a not-for-profit needs a board of directors to function in an orderly manner, it's hard to reconcile the board's actions with its fiduciary duties. If fiduciary means total loyalty to the well-being of the organization, it's not clear 
why all the board directors would resign at exactly the same time from a risk management perspective. Enough of that. I think you get the point. Risk management may sound like it's focusing on the negative, but it's actually the opposite that it's at play. We're trying to create conditions that are best aligned for success. Risk management. I'm going to take some questions from the floor. Do people have... Um, yes. We've been talking a lot about telling your story. Yep. Would we be better off not using a complete narrative and starting to look at maybe some kind of graphic analysis that would inform our board better as we assess the risks now that we know, you know more from your talk? Or is it still about storytelling? Ooh, that's an interesting question. I, I think the important part of... Um, of, uh, uh, of the question is that you've got to have an exchange with your board on the subject. I can assure you that your board at some point, if you don't do anything or don't raise the subject yourself, is going to raise it for you. Especially boards, uh, board members who come from business will ask themselves, why aren't they raising risk with us? Why aren't, are, are they trying to cover something up? Are they hiding something? Whether or not you used a graphic representation or used some other form of communication isn't as compelling to me. It, uh, per personally, I'm, you know, I, I'm either here nor there. Organizations have different scale, etc. So I, c I can tell you, I was shocked um, to discover that an organization that I sit on the board of, um, uh, Art of Time, decided this year to present its budget and its program for next year within an arts management framework, uh, sorry, risk management framework. I was stunned. I had never actually seen a board present the core business of the organization within a risk management framework. And I thought to myself, holy Toledo, like the real world is writing my content here. I, I, I think it's time, I think it's hot, I think it's something that we need to master as arts managers, that we need to master the language of risk management so we, need, we, so we know how to talk to our board, so we know how to stay in touch with what the, I, I won't call it the flavor of the month, if you go back 3,000 years, that's one hell of a lot of months, um, but something that's currently very, very um, active and uh, on the minds of a heck of a lot of people. There is a reason why the financial community moved into this so desperately. People love risk in the financial community. They just all the time think that they're gonna beat it. And when they don't beat it, they put enormous pressure on the, uh, on the profession to find some way, some better way of giving them assurance that the billions of dollars that they invest on a daily, weekly, monthly, trillions uh, uh, a, a basis is not lost. And um, I, would, I would say to you that that's um, equally, equally you know, reasonable within our own, our own particular work. Yes. Yep. And they don't have experience with risk management. And how do you <coughs> convince them that they're still a good behavior that you tell us, even though they just don't show us that decision? And then how do you um, ensure that they do a good performance through their risk? Um, or create realistic policies and realistic risk management strategies? Well, um, the, the risk management strategies don't first and foremost reside with the board. They, they, the strategies themselves really reside with management, in my opinion. It's the board that demands them, typically. So if you find yourself in a circumstance where the board is not demanding them, um, f fine. You know, it's, it's not something that you have a lot of pressure to perform on, but it would be wise in your own thinking to say, well, you know, actually this might help me. This might help me to know what are the three things that I should be working hardest on next year to assure 
the stability and the well-being of this organization? And how can I positively um, d discuss them with my board? So for example, you know, we don't have a lot of formal HR policies in my organization, but uh, I, I think that puts us at risk because um, contractual relations are such an important part of what makes the organization successful. You know, the finance is only one half of it, the other half of it is the people. Um, maybe I should be doing more on the people side. And that would be a risk management strategy that I'd like to argue to the board deserves a little bit more money. So it might cost a little bit more money or time or effort or whatever. What the, what the board absolutely has to do though is settle on the risk appetite. That's different than the risk strategy. The risk appetite where they get, where you get kind of buy-in and you, and you get a reading from them, well, you know, how much is enough? You know, how much risk can I take before I'm get, I get fired, right? right? Uh, th that's a good conversation. That's a good conversation. Yes? What was the revenue they were looking for in terms of financial return? Uh-huh. Well, if you're an arts organization, um, uh, if you're an arts organization and you're counting on, let's say, ticket sales or exhibition attendance, and then it turns out that the performance or the exhibition is not artistically, it, it doesn't resonate well with markets or something, then you have a financial, then you have a financial issue. And the, and the question that sh should be raised is, um, uh, have you built your year in such a way that you can accommodate an unsuccessful show? If you've built a year in which you get repeatedly unsuccessful uh, shows, you are, in, you are in financial trouble. Your, your organization is now in difficulty and you ought to be challenging in some way the leadership or the decisions that are going on um, in the mounting of the show. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm myself wrestling with a lot personally is whether or not there's such a thing as artistic failure. You know, I keep thinking there isn't actually. You know, Bob, there isn't. Um, I keep saying this to myself because I want to believe it de desperately. You know, when people say just fail bigger or fail better, um, I, I, I think they're really talking to us in the arts because that's how you learn and that's where you understand where the limits are, etc. But when you introduce a financial edge to it, um, it, it can be quite complicated. There is such a thing as a financial failure with an artistic product. But, but what I'm having trouble with is whether or not there's such a thing as an artistic failure. Um, I, I guess one could say that incompetence would be an artistic failure or, or something, but you, you understand why I'm, why I'm doing that. Uh, they, are, they are connected in the life of an organization that's an arts organization because the, or, the organization likely is getting its reputation from the art, the quality of the art, but the organization may also get a very positive reputation from a number of high profile, um, e you know, extraordinary risks um, that excite, excite people. You know, there are many organizations that are proud to say, you know, people hated my last show and said, we can't wait to see the next one. Be just, be just because they like that edge. I was, I, I was like really uh, blown away to find out that people in this cold weather on the weekend had lined up all night to buy new running shoes <laughs> that were re released with the NBA All-Star game. New running shoes, and they were a partnership, a partnership between um, Drake and, and God, Magic Johnson, or God knows who else, who else? Michael, Jordan. Michael Jordan, right. <laughs> People stayed all night in like minus 25 degree temperatures to buy something they hadn't even seen. And I mean, I have a lot of respect for Drake, but I haven't got any confidence that he knows how to design a running shoe. <laughs> right? like, like, none whatsoever. And yet organizations are able to um, brand themselves in, a, in, a, you know, in, in an extraordinarily successful risk-taking mode. So the release of a pair of shoes, you know, who, who, who knew? Who, who attends you know, our new shows with that kind of excitement? people lining up all night in the cold t 
to be the first to see something that, you know, is only word of mouth. No one has seen an image of, no one owns a painted cast, etc. cetera. I, I, I love this. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of time. <laughs>